You're listening to the Agile Uprising Podcast. My name is Sonny Singh. I'm a former data scientist who turned his back on that world to pursue my lifelong dream of filming bands. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Hersko. And tonight's topic, we're going to talk about personal productivity. So we have a lot of folks that come on the show that talk about lean, that talk about Kanban, that talk about all these things that help us be productive in our work life. But what happens when you try and apply some of these techniques, either knowingly or unknowingly, when it comes to your personal life? And that leads us to our very special guest tonight, uh, Sunny Singh from Hate 5 6 Sunny, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Jack. So, Sonny, for those of the, who, who may not know you or may not be familiar with work, can you give us a little bit of background about uh, what you do and what brings you to us tonight? Yep. So, as I said in the, in the little intro, I'm a former data scientist. I have a background in computer science and engineering. Um, basically, about 10 years ago, I started filming bands just as a hobby. I was going to a lot of concerts as a kid growing up, and I started bringing a video camera to these shows, and I began documenting everything. And so while I was in grad school studying computer science and also while working in tech at various tech companies, I was continuing to film these bands in my free time. And over the last 10 years, I've built up an archive of about over 3,000 videos at this point, uh, everything that I've filmed and archived. Um, I've built a site around it, and I've built a lot of um, tools and things like that, a lot of band recommendation thing, uh, a lot of band recommendation apps around it to help viewers who are coming to my site find their next favorite band. So. Um, Basically, back in January, I got laid off from my last tech job, and I decided to take the plunge and try doing 8 by 6 full-time. Um, so I, I've been using Patreon, which is a crowdfunding platform, to basically fund uh, myself being a content creator. So I'm now wearing multiple hats of you know filming and archiving bands, but I'm also continuing my work as a developer, uh, but focusing 100% of my development skills to make my tools and site better for, to help people find their next favorite band easier. So you're not working for the man, you're working for yourself. Exactly. So in quite, quite enviable position. Um, so the first thing, Sonny, I want to ask you about, um, so you said, you, you know, you tape multiple shows, you have this, this rather large archive, and one of the key concepts we talk about in the Agile world is the work in progress, right? WIP. So, um, and I, and I, I, tr true admission here, I am a Sonny fan, for those listeners, um, I have seen him in multiple shows, and a typical show is anywhere from between three and five bands a night. And there are shows, I think Sonny would have, between three and five nights a week, legitimately, right? You could keep yourself busy if you wanted to. Yeah. Probably it's, almost every other night. Yeah, if, if I wanted to, I could. So, so I guess my first question is, in regards to work in progress, how do, you, how do you maintain that steady state? How do you not burn yourself out? Because it is a passion project, so it's really easy to get excited and go all in. How do you not go nuts and, and still maintain that consistent flow state of in and out and in and out? Yeah, it's difficult. Before I went full time with it, I was I would definitely reach points of burnout, and I think that at the time, before Hate Five Six was my full time job, it was just a passion project, and I I was able to sense that you know I'm burning out, I'm filming too much, editing is taking too much time, that I was able to you know take take a step back and not film for a little bit, or I'd pursue some of my other passions like BMX or play hockey or or do something else that's that wasn't this. So. I think before going full time, I think having something else that I could offset my attention to was would, would allow me to avoid that that type of burnout. Um, so I've only been doing this full time for about a year. Well, even before I was technically full time, I was still putting in more than forty hours a week running the site. So um, now that this is what I'm focusing on, one hundred ten percent of my time, um, I'm I'm trying to become much more aware of my limits and my boundaries of you know, I'm starting to reach a point where I'm maxing out, but I think that I have a good sense of how much I can film physically. So I'm, I'm, I'm able to film like a fest of a three day fest with 40 or 50 bands, but I can only do that once every few months. Cause I know that I, I physically could not do that for, for multiple fests each month. So I try to be aware of physically how much, how much can I take? Like what is my physical, what, what is you know my physical limitation with standing there holding a camera and dodging stage divers and things like that. Um, but in terms of balancing my workload, I've become a pretty fairly well oiled machine in terms of coming home after a show and, um, updating, you know, I maintain a list of here are the things that I'm working on. And one of, one of the things that I've done in the last couple months is I've democratized the process. So now that, um, how it works now is viewers who are supporting me via Patreon can actually have, 
you know, they have creative control and a creative input in terms of how I'm running the project. So um, members of the platform can go and vote for what videos they want to see next, and they can vote for what videos I'm going to order, or what videos I'm going to be editing tomorrow. And so that for me, um, it wanted to democratize the process, and two, it helps me prioritize my workload. So I know that, you know, okay, you know, I have X percentage of my viewers really want to see this video tomorrow, so I better better make sure I, I, I need to edit it sooner than later. So I'm trying to rely on these sorts of tools that I'm developing to help manage and structure like my time. So you're, you're almost, you know, you, you, you're getting ahead of me, but you, you're, you're hitting on the, you're hitting on the prioritization piece, which is another thing we're going to talk about. So, so we'll, we'll come back to that about how you've, you've actually offloaded that to your actual fan base, which is, which is ingenious in of itself. Um, and Sonny, I didn't, I didn't ask you, so you're all self-taught with this, right? It's not like you took, you know, Michael Bay's introduction to filmography, right? You're all basically doing it off the cuff and, and learn as you go. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a self-taught videographer. Um, and again, it just, and, and I, for me, I feel like the best way to learn many things is just by trying it, whether it's doing software development. I mean, there's certain things that you can only learn in a classroom and you benefit from learning in the classroom. But I think largely for me, um, just going through the trial and error of learning something new has been invaluable. So uh, one piece of advice I give to everyone is don't be afraid of failure. So every time I fail, you know, I've, I've always, I've, I've failed multiple times. I will continue to fail, but I use failure as like a data point and I figure out, okay, I failed because of X, Y, and Z. And the next time I reapproach that problem, I know how to avoid those pitfalls. But so video, the, the, the skill with filming and also editing was just through trial and error for from just doing it for 10 years and figuring out, okay, this works, this doesn't work. I'm sure I'm doing things that aren't by the book and probably are inefficient for most people, but um, I've sort of carved out a groove and, and niche that works very well for me, and I feel like I've optimized that process. So I've kind of stuck with that that sort of uh, way of working. But I'm always learning from other people who are telling me, oh, you should try doing it this, try doing it this way, try doing it that way. And I find that that actually is a more optimal approach. So. Um, as hardened and as you know, as hardened in my ways as I am, I'm still constantly looking for new and better ways of getting things done. So, and that's that's interesting because that that brings a lot to the forefront of some of the stuff we talk about um, on this podcast. Even we talk about like the lean startup and the whole um, you know fast feedback via small iterations and the whole continue pivot or kill, right? That sort of thing. Um, so, you just touched on this, and I want to dig a little deeper into that. So, you have actually background doing IT work, and you were doing data science, right? Which does tie to some of the sage stuff that we're, we're going to get to later in the in the episode. Um, but you have like you have like an IT background, so some of the things that we're talking about with with like agile and lean and lean. You, you've already seen that in your professional life, yes? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm, I have a, I have a master's degree in computer science, and I worked in a couple different um, sectors, working mostly in re research type settings, not really building forward facing apps. I've worked as a back end developer here and there, but um, largely my role for some of these tech companies was just doing a lot of the initial AI, like building uh, prototype models, um, artificial intelligent models using. Um, Python and things like that. So I, we were incorporating some elements of the agile, you know, development structure and, and theme in terms of like having daily um, standups and scrums to figure out, you know, here's where we are, here's where we're going next. Um, and also, you know, again, even though I wasn't building um, forward facing deployable um, products, I was, we were still doing rapid iterations and rapid cycles through our, um, research and development. So, you know, trying to build a model that has a certain level of predictive, predictive capability and um, see if we can get to that point within a week. And if not, then we reassess, okay, maybe we should add more data. Maybe we should tweak the model this way. So I think that having that background definitely helped inform me and gave me um, a little bit of insight in terms of how I'm going to be structuring my work as a, you know, again, I'm still developing, but I'm also now trying to apply that with my work as a videographer and, and editor as well. So it's interesting how um, talking back to your whip limit, like it's almost physically enforced, right? Like I've been to, and we're going to get to this is hardcore at some of the bigger festivals and how that, how that work differs from some of the like, you know, just showing at a brand venue on a Tuesday night. Um, your, your whip limit, I mean, I wish most of us had, had a way that we could physically limit how much work we could do at once um, because, you know, the way the, the highest, person, highest paid person's opinion works, they don't really, they don't really care about that right. stuff. Um, so Sonny, for let, let's talk a little bit about like cycle time, 
and, and, and how your flow works, like your cumulative flow through the system. So um, can you give our listeners just a rough idea? Like we're talking about, you know, you record a set and then you release it. Um, what is the, typically, what kind of work goes into that? How do you, how does that, um, how does that piece of work go from, I'm at a show on a Tuesday night, I'm at the Trocadero in Philly, and then um, X amount of time later, I have a video that's ready to go that, that based upon your democratized process, will eventually see light of day. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, so there, there are two, there are essentially two types of Hate Five Six videos. There are, there's sort of what I like to call a Hate Five Six light, and there's the more advanced version. The light version is, Essentially, it's a single camera. I go to a show, I film it. I may get a very basic soundboard feed, but I, I most likely just get an ambient audio recording. And then there's the more advanced videos, which are three to four camera angles. I hire a couple friends to help operate the cameras, and I hire a soundboard engineer to come and multi-track all of the microphones, all the instruments, and then I pay engineers to mix and master that, and then they give me that audio back, and then I, I cut together a multiple camera edit from that. So those are the two types of videos. Um, first, I'll talk about the, the first, the Hate Five Six Light videos. So those, obviously, I go to the show. It might be five, six bands, however many bands for a couple hours. I'm standing there filming everything. Um, what I do then is after the show ends, I, I, I basically built a very simple app that I can enter in the band and the date, and I, I run the app. It'll automatically, uh, it'll automatically post to Twitter, post to Facebook, and update my site saying, Hey, Hate Five Six just filmed these five bands on this date. Um, you can go to the vote. You can use the voting app right now to vote to see these videos sooner than later. So the first step is, you know, I film the show, um, turn the camera off, I run the app, and then I go home. Um, the next step is then either that night or the next morning, I'll dump the memory cards. And so um, every, everything that I film now is onto a compact flash card. That's all. It's all like solid state. I can just plug the card in and dump it. Where previously my older cameras, they were recording to like basically tapes that I would have to play in real time and capture in real time. So if I film like an, if I film five hours worth of footage a couple of years ago, I would, it would take me five hours to capture that recording to the computer. Uh, but in, since 2011, I've been using these memory cards, so it's, it's much faster. So I dump the cards. I create a very basic folder structure of just um, in my working directory. It's um, Every band, the name of every band has their own folder. And then within each of the, each, each subfolder, there's a directory of the date. Because uh, basically, I store all of my raw footage in a RAID array that I built. And the RAID array is indexed by band and by date. So um, once I've created the directory structure, um, I imp I, what I typically do is I spend most of my time working on the headliner or the, 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 the top two bands that played that night. So the first step is I bring in the audio, I bring in the video and bring in the, the audio track as, as well. Um, I, I use a plugin called Pluralize to sync them together because I'm, I'm actually recording the audio separately from the video. And the reason is I could theoretically connect my external microphone to the camera and record the audio directly, but I record them separately just as a fail safe, just in case my, my microphone dies, the battery dies or whatever, whatever happens to it. At least, as long as they're not coupled, I'll, I'll at least have a backup from the microphone on the camera. Whereas if I couple them, then I'm sort of overriding the, the, the backup, the fail safe. So first step is to sync them. Um, I end up applying some EQ and compression to adjust the highs and lows and mids a little bit. Um, some com compression to make it sound a little bit beefier on the low end and a little bit of mastering. And on, on, the, video, on the video end, I maybe do a little bit of color correction. Um, then the final step is, is basically creating a title. And so I have to look up, I, I try to use the band's logo. So I, I look up their band camp or I go to their Facebook page. I try to download a, a logo if they have it. If not, then I have to search on Google to find a flyer of theirs and use Photoshop to pull out the logo. Because I'm, I'm trying to be very uh, pedantic and very thorough with how I'm representing the band. And part of that is being true to their likeness and their image, which, is, which means using their logo. Um, so typically I'll spend maybe... You know, so the, the, according to my data, the, the average band plays for about 24 and a half minutes. So the average set is 24 and a half minutes. Um, I'll spend maybe on the headlining band, maybe 15 to 20 minutes editing. Um, and then I'll, I'll, those EQ compression and um, color correcting settings, I'll, I'll save as a preset. And then for the remaining videos of that night at that show, I'll apply the same preset and maybe do a little bit of tweaking. So the, re the remaining sets, end up taking significantly less time. So I would say for a five band show, 
with each band playing between 25 to 40 minutes, I'm maybe spending two hours editing tops. Um, then the next step is to export those videos and that can take another, you know, for a half hour long video it could take maybe 25 minutes to render and then I have to upload it. And so what I do is I upload it to Vimeo. Um, by default, it's a private video. And um, once these videos are uploaded there and, and they're private, I basically run another app that I created that takes those newly uploaded videos and adds them to my queue. So I, I mentioned that the first app that I run after a show, it updates my live queue. So anyone who's a viewer can go, they can see my live queue. They can see everything that I filmed and I have edited but hasn't been released. But they can also go on there and see everything that I filmed and I haven't edited yet. So the second app that I run after uploading the videos privately, it'll go on the, it'll basically, it'll change the, the status on the voting page from a red video to a green video. Green meaning, uh, meaning it means that the video has been edited and it's now eligible for release. So um, that's basically the process of editing and uploading. And at that point, it's out of my hands. And so what I've done then is I've created like um, an adaptive scheduling algorithm that basically, uh, well, it's not adaptive anymore. It used to be adaptive, but now it's, it's deterministic. So how it works is every morning my site will, um, it'll take all of those videos that have been marked green. And again, green means it's been edited and ready to go. It'll take all of those green videos. It'll tally up all the votes that have been um, tallied. It'll, it'll tally up all the votes that have been submitted by viewers for those videos and then I'll rank them accordingly. So um, every morning I'll get an e I, every morning the system emails me at 9 a.m. and says, oh, at 11 a.m. this video is going to come out, just so I have a heads up, just so I have a couple hours notice. Um, there are times when I can override it. I can basically, if a band has a album coming out next week or they have a big announcement, I can override the system and make sure their video comes out before, before that announcement. Um, one little caveat that I've sort of baked in there is I've, all, I've always been concerned that newer bands or lesser known bands might not get a lot of votes. So my concern is that uh, the popular bands will always get the most votes and will always be at the top. So I sort of baked in a little system where the longer a video sits in the queue, the more artificial votes it gets. So bands that are videos that are getting stale in the queue, they automatically bubble up to the top the longer that they are in the queue. So that's a way of making it a little bit even, even the playing field a little bit for these other bands, but also encouraging people to really be active voters and be active participants in ranking these videos. Um, but so when it comes to the release time, so at 11, eight, usually I, I typically try to post, um, I typically post one video a day, maybe two videos a day, um, but at 11 a.m. is usually the first slot. So at 11 a.m., the video will get, the, the top ranked video will get automatically re released from the queue. So it'll go from private to public on Vimeo, it gets added to the Hate 5 6 uh, database on the back end. Um, that triggers an event that uh, fires the video off on Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And so everyone who's following me in there gets an immediate alert. Um, people who are using the voting system get an automatic email saying this video just went up. Click here to watch it. Um, and there's some other things that happen in the database that add updates, you know, metadata on my end. Um, the only manual thing that I have to do is create an Instagram clip. So I also post a clip on Instagram saying, hey, this video just went live. Here's a clip. Here's where you can find more information about it. Um, the reason for that is I haven't found a good API to actually um, integrate to automatically post to Instagram. And also, I'm creating these clips by hand. I'm actually looking for the most exciting 60-second clip that I can then post to Instagram. So on that, I don't have AI yet that can detect the most interesting sequence of video to post, but eventually maybe one day I can get, I can get there and I won't have to do it by hand. I think if you could do that, uh, guys like Zuckerberg and um, uh, the Jack Dorsey would be banging down your door looking to use that to make their lives easier. I think yeah, you yeah. really could retire. Um, right. So, Sonny, when you were talking about um, your cycle time and how you work through your videos and how much time it takes, you, you touched on a lot of topics that, that we seem to talk about in, in the uh, in the answer consulting space a lot. Um, your notifications. So, I, I for those listeners, uh, Disclaimer, I am a Patreon, right? So I do support Sonny's work and I do get these notifications. So the notifications are a great way actually to provide visibility into your process because you're letting people know that, hey, this was just recorded. Hey, this has been added to queue. Hey, this work is out there, um, which is a big thing that we preach, you know, the, the whole 
um, there's the the Dominican grants, you know, the five feeds of time. One of the things is unplanned work or unvis un unvisualized work. So you're actually providing that for yourself and you're actually not, well, not only to your listeners, but you're also providing it to yourself. You said you get a notification every morning that says, hey, you know, bearing any unforeseen circumstances or manual changes, this video is going out. So that's, that's fascinating in the sense that you're actually providing visibility, not only downstream, but also upstream to yourself as well, which is huge. Um, I thought that was fascinating when you said that you, you do consistency by preset for when you watch some of the video and some of the audio to get all the, the same sets from the same venue. Obviously, anybody who's been to a live concert knows different venues have different nuances around how their sound works. Um, so you actually maintain consistency uh, via consistent application of the setting, which is, which is uh, one of the things we'll talk about when we get to like your, your deployment and all that. Um, we, we harp on that monster consistently in the consulting space about how you need to um, apply everything equally and then automate it. It's like the whole thing about DevOps, right, and the whole automated deployments, less manual intervention, more by the code, and that in, that conforms and forces coherence um, at the at the programmatic level. Uh, the one thing that you did touch on, what I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, um, uh, one of the things we talk about is work sits in queue too long, right? So large queues, um, you, uh, and we're going to get to uh, your throughput in a minute because uh, prolific as a as a verb, I don't even think it's close to describing. It. <laughs> um, it's it's actually not fair to you. Um, but you do have it, and anybody, we're going to have tons of links in the show notes to Sunny site and some graphics. Um, you can actually see all the stuff that's in there. See so you um, through through your experience with um, with uh, some of the artificial intelligence type stuff you're working on. You actually help the the stuff that's lower in queue bubble up more to the top, as opposed to just sitting out there in the ether for maybe somebody sees it, maybe somebody don't. Yeah, that's that's pretty wild. Um, and I also uh, I would love to maybe later pick your brain about, you say, you know, 24.5 minutes on the average is an average set that you film. Um, you probably get a lot of data like that around show times, set times, band performance that um, if you could find a way to turn that into like a cottage industry, right? Like, yeah. oh, well, book, book these six bands on your event and you're guaranteed to have them on or off stage in six minutes each. Right. And, you know, <laughs> time check, whatever. You'd be like, you know, automate um, – no, but then we get those terrifying, like, automated festival lineups, which is, like, I know. Yeah. you know, it'd be, like, a, a five-finger death punch, uh, bad wolves, Fane, and then, like, somebody else, like Greta Van Vliet, who just doesn't fit whatsoever. Right, right. <laughs> so let's let's talk about throughput. So, again, like I said, prolific doesn't come close. Um, and I am going to ask you, Sonny, for that graphic you have that shows your history of how many videos you've released per day. And then yeah, I can tell you. You do one per day, um, or uh, sometimes two per day. So, um and you, talk, you touched on it a bit in our previous conversation. So that is the, one of the things we're always preaching in, in the Agile space is consistency, right? Consistent delivery and predictability. And you've actually maintained that. Um, so, uh, and I guess let's, let's tie that to um, your deployments. You said, so that's all automated. So once you load your, it sounds to me uh, from a layman, once you do all the audio and the video, and like you said, you get the band logo, you wash it, you make it look great, it really just sits there. And then the machine basically runs itself based upon, um, for what we call product owners, but the people who come in and decide what we work on next. Yep. Yeah, so again, like I, I so how it used to work is, um, so before I was using Patreon, anyone could go on there and vote. And so, um, I still call it an adaptive schedule and that's just because the legacy of it, but how it used to work was that um, I would analyze, I would, I would analyze the peak traffic times on my site. So I used to have a heat map that would show me over the last 30 days, um, Wednesday at 2 PM was the peak traffic time. So what I would do is I would rank the videos based off of the votes and I would, I would assign them a slot based, it was sort of like a, um, a, a slot assignment algorithm was basically I had a rank ordered list of the bands and a rank ordered list of optimal set times again by basically analyzing the traffic on my site which which bands were getting those views what times were people watching them and assigning the videos accordingly and before I you know this, so the original version I had the, the original idea that I had for helping the lower the lower um, ranked videos get an optimal slot was that I had I used to set a probability threshold so as it was assigning these bands to the, the peak slots, there's always a, not, a very small but non-zero probability that a new band with no votes would get assigned to the peak slot. So I tried to maintain the fairness that way. So um, again, now it's, it's all deterministic in the sense that viewers are voting and the system will give it a default vote every seven days that it's in the queue, but 
before it was analyzing both the peak traffic time and also with some random probability making sure that a lower band had a chance of being on the page at the time of people being on there the most. So um, I think that by creating, and this sort of touches what you were saying before, but I think by creating this sort of public facing list of everything that's out there, it one shows everyone my process. You can actually, you know, people, it's funny, people, people still message me like, oh, did you film that show last night? It's like, you can go and, you can go and look at the queue right now. This, I updated it immediately. You can actually see what's on there. Um, so one, it's, it's to help people see what's, what's coming up. But for me, it helps me keep on top of my workload. So for me, it's like a visual checklist. I, I, every morning I go, I go and see, uh, I log on to that voting system and I see, okay, these 10 videos are still red, meaning I still have to edit them. Let me, let me start working on them. So I use that as a way for me to prioritize, prioritize my work and make sure that I'm not missing anything. Cause, uh, before I started maintaining that list online, I just kind of go with memory. Like, oh, I'm pretty sure I edited Integrity two nights ago. I'm pretty sure I edited the three other bands from that night. But now I can literally just go on there and see what I, see what everyone else is seeing, and you know, be with uh, you know with 100% confidence and certainty, know that I need to work on these three three videos next. That's it touches on so many things that we talk about, like the visibility, the, the even the adaptive scheduling, right? You're you're using data and feedback that you've noticed from your process to actually drive improvements in the process itself. So we talk about that recursive feedback loop. We talk about that um, for all the agile coaches, right? We talk about the retrospective and and using um, learnings to drive improvements in the space. You're actually doing that almost um, electronically. You've taught the system to to not self heal, but to self correct and learn as it goes. Yeah. What's what's interesting about that. So there were were a couple of instances where I remember there was a, this is hardcore in 2015 where I filmed a Japanese band, a band called Sand. And I posted that video and I noticed a week later that the peak traffic time was like 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I was like, what, what the hell's going on? And I realized what was happening was that 4 a.m. is what, like 6 p.m. in Japan the next day? Yeah. yeah. So that was when that video was getting a lot of traffic. So that was actually, that feedback loop was, in, was being influenced by a peak traffic time. So. 4 a.m. is typically not an ideal time for me to post a video, except in the case where it's an international band from that from that region. But so that was a case where um, I had to sort of step in and be like, okay, you know, this is the, the system is learning something that's it's learning an anomaly and it shouldn't be, it should not consistently post a video at 4 a.m. It doesn't, if things set the optimal time, but it actually isn't. It's sort of it mislearned from that 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 error. But so that's, even that, that sort of edge case. But even still, I mean that that shows that that shows the importance of telemetry, right? That shows the importance of looking at what's actually going on in the system. Um, yeah. And we preach this stuff on the DevOps side alone. You know, mean time to resolve and and uh, time you know, deployments per day. You're actually looking at um, how often your site gets hit. And I've seen the map where you show um, who's coming from what geographic regions. So where's the heaviest traffic coming from? What times of day? Um, that's wild because you because you you had the forethought. Um, which a lot of people don't, which is which is why that you did it by yourself. Um, and I think it's a data scientist background. You sort of cheated it out. Um, you know that by looking at what you're doing and how it's performing, you can actually drive improvements in the system, and that's it's just bananas. Um, so we've talked about we talked about throughput. We've talked about predictability. So prioritization. Um, we did touch on, so you have a giant page which actually color codes videos showing which ones have, are filmed but are raw, which ones have been mastered and are waiting, which ones are, and you even have ones where, um, you know, we talk about um, uh, expedite lanes in Kanban, or we talk about ones where you need to put something in a hold state. You even have tags as well that shows like, um, say I'm in a band and my, my album comes out in two months and I don't want to release anything yet because I'm going to do a full PR blitz. You actually have the ability to, to hold back certain pieces of work if it's if it's deemed okay we want to release this later or we want to um, we want to hold it for a later date so you, you've got all those process steps in place that we talk about with Kanban the, the skips and whatnot which is which is pretty pretty bonkers um, and so the prioritization is actually done by the voters right it's 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 federated to the what, what we call product owners and I and I've done it myself um, oh, I can never remember my damn password. I go in and I vote and I say, okay, well, I want to see, I want to see, um, I don't know. I, w- I want to see, uh, what was the one I just voted for? Oh, revocation. Like, I want to see revocation. I want to see Rivers and I want to see Bell Witch. Running joke there. Um, so 
every time that vote goes in, it gets tabulated. And you can actually see behind the scenes what's going on, right? And so you, you even by looking at the data, I'm assuming you have a pretty good idea of, okay, well, I think that these five videos are going to be next in queue because it looks like that's what's getting the most, the most upvotes or the most, for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah. So I actually, I, I want to start building some, like an analytics dashboard that shows me how many active, how many people are actually voting per day. Look at those distributions. I think that'll give me some insight. Um, for a while, I had it structured so that people could only vote for a video once, and that was it. Um, but I, it was funny because when I had that in place, the top most, and this is very recently, this is only like about a month ago, uh, the top most video only had nine votes or something. So people weren't actively coming on there to vote. So I decided to make the change. So now every day you can, you can log on and vote for the same video and it'll count as a unique vote. So that was a way to encourage people to return to the app and be more active with voting. So um, if you're, you know, anyone can go on the page right now, you can actually see what the, the total vote count is. And you can actually, there's a uh, stats button that'll show you the distribution of how many videos have five votes, how many videos have 30 votes. And you can, you can actually get a sense of the distribution that way. Um, I have some tooling on my end that I run every morning that I can actually visualize and see. Um, uh, it'll rank the videos based off of the votes, um, the system votes, and then it'll, it'll rank them by the total votes, which is the number of viewer votes and then the system votes. And then um, it'll show me the, as of today, what day is this going to be coming out? So um, I basically set up a cron job that runs my release system every, every morning or every day at 11 a.m. Or it, it, how, how it works is um, I had the, the scheduling al algorithm can um, right now it, it, it be, it's set to one by default. So it schedules one video per day, but I can override it and say schedule two per day. And it, it'll re it'll re uh, compute those um, expected release dates for me. So I have some tooling on my end that shows me the predicted uh, predicted release date. And that can, that changes every day based off of how many votes are coming in um, and things like that. So, um, so I'm on my end able to get at least like a kind of like behind the scenes view. Okay. This is what the next week looks like. And we didn't really touch on it, but I have like those, those, um, higher end eight by six videos with the multiple cameras and soundboard audio. Those take much longer to produce because I'm waiting for a soundboard mix to come back from someone. And I have to sit there and literally cut between multiple cameras. So, and those videos get a lot of, those videos tend to get a lot of traffic. Those are the videos that people really are excited to see. So those are prioritized a little bit differently. Um, I prior, you know, I sort of tell the sound engineers that I'm, that I'm, that I'm working with, you know, if you can get me these five videos, if you can get me soundboard mixes done for these five videos in the next week, then I can work on them. And basically how I structure it is as soon as those videos are done, I, I manually assign them a slot. So, for example, we, we talked about This Is Hardcore. This Is Hardcore is a big fest that I filmed. Um, this week I've had a lot of time and I've been able to sit down and edit a bunch of them. So I've, I think I've edited four or five This Is Hardcore sets this week. Um, but I, I don't want to post them all at once or all in the same week because I know that I want to drive as much traffic to each of those videos because I know that they're going to have a lot of attention. So I'm typically structuring it. So I posted one on Tuesday. I'm going I'm to manually release one on Friday. And I think next week, maybe Tuesday and Thursday or something like that. So those are on a separate schedule because those are the higher end videos that I know will get a lot of uh, shares and views. So that once those come in, they are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get like a batch of five of them done. I'll rank them by votes. And once I know that, okay, this is the one with the most votes, I'll manually assign that a peak slot that I know. So I, I know that, you know, Tuesday morning is a good slot. So I'll give that one the 11 a.m. I know maybe like Wednesday at 4 p.m. is good. So then I'll give the second higher end video that slot and go from there. So those are typically prioritized. It's a combination of both ranking them by what people want, but then giving them a slot based on what I know is going to be a peak traffic time. Right, right. That's where the, that's where the data and your experience comes into play. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for providing the perfect segue because that's what I wanted to touch on next. So you, you talked earlier about the different types of videos you do. You do hate five, six light, and then you do the stuff that's more involved. And you just mentioned this is hardcore. So for those that don't know, um, this is hardcore is a giant um, music festival. It takes place the last weekend in July every year in August, uh, not in August, in Philadelphia. Uh, geez, I have another beer. Um, and it's somewhere in sunny, keep me honest. It's usually three or four days. And it averages, I think it's like 12, is it 12 to 15 bands a day? It starts at 12 p.m. 
is is open and it goes till about usually ten, and then there's an after show usually after. So on yeah. a, on a on a random on a random festival weekend, I mean you're you're looking at probably close to sixty seventy bands if you're doing all the after shows, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and this ties to um, dependency management. Like one of the things we talk about when we visualize our work, and we get it all in front of us, and we 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 try to keep the unplanned work at bay. Now you have dependencies, like you said. Yeah, and I know you use. You use audio engineers from all over the country, right? You have, you know, Dylan, uh, Dylan Tash, and then there's, uh, I know you had the guy from Nails do a couple uh, out in California. So how do you manage that sort of stuff? Like, um, like you said, you have multiple camera angles so now. You're cutting in pieces. You're patching in the audio from a different, from a third party who's mastering it. Um, how does all that? How do you keep all that in your head? Because that's nuts, right? Like that's that's a whole different level. Yeah, that's difficult. I mean, I have a lot of issues with dependency management. Um, I feel like Hate Five Six has been successful, and I've been able to maintain this level of throughput because I'm, aside from aside from those higher end videos, I'm the only one working on this stuff. A lot of people want to get involved, and maybe one day I'll start doing. It, but I, my fear is that as soon as I sort of, well, as soon as I start needing to depend on other people's throughput, I feel like that's going to create bottlenecks for me. I feel like I've created like a really good system for getting stuff done. And when something breaks, it's on me to fix. And I know that I can, I can count on myself to do it. Um, so the dependency with the engineers is a little difficult. Um, mostly because all of the, all those guys do amazing work, but they all have full-time jobs. They all have families. So they have other commitments. So for me, it's, you know, the fest is in July and I, I, t I typically tell them, Hey, if each of you can get one or two video, each, each of you get one or two mixes done within the next couple weeks, then we can start pumping these videos out in mid to late August while it's, fresh, while it's still fresh in people's minds. And so it's a little slow. It's, a, it's kind of like a cold start getting it to get the, get, you know, get the ball rolling. Um, but typically the idea is, you know, once they've gotten a couple mixes done, then it's on me to sit there and edit them. And again, so I've worked on, um, I, I edited two, this is hard for us today, they were about 15 minutes each but they were four camera angles and I had to sit there and cut between them. And what people don't realize is like, yes, it's a 15 minute set, but I watched it maybe four or five times because I'm trying to make sure I'm getting the right cuts in their time correctly. So I'm spending multiple hours on just a 15 to 20 minute set. So the idea is um, while I'm working on this set of videos, um, ideally the engineers are working on the next three or four videos that they're assigned to. So we have a system in place. So Len Carmichael from Landmark Studios is my main engineer. Um, he's he's the one who got me into the idea of doing soundboard stuff back at This Is Hardcore 2012. Um, so what we do is he's he's there with me at the fest, recording all the audio and doing a lot of debugging on the fly and making sure that microphones aren't getting unplugged and things like that. Um, so what happens is um, Len gets first dibs on what bands he wants to mix because the way he looks at it is you know, the bands that he gets to mix, he'll, he'll have his name on them. And if those videos go viral, he'll get his name out further and that'll hopefully drive more business to him. So I'm, I'm trying to get to a point where I can pay my, where I can pay my engineers um, appropriately. Um, but right now it's a combination of giving them some money, but also trying to help elevate their, their name as, as an engineer. So um, we've created a system where the engineers vote for what videos they want to mix. They basically, it's, it's a separate voting system from what viewers are voting for, but basically the, the engineers rank, you know, um, these are my top three videos that I really want to mix. These next five are ones that I'm kind of, you know, I would, I'd be okay with. These last three are ones I really just do not want to work on for whatever reason. So it's sort of like a linear programming kind of scheduling, you know, typically like a, how, how companies will organize a meeting. Everyone sort of says this time slot works for me, this doesn't work for me. So we're, we're trying to do that where people are ranking what audio they want to work on. And we sort of, we come up with a soft assignment that way. So we, we, we try to assign everyone um, at least a couple of videos that they really want to work on and then give them, you know, fill in the rest of, you know, we, we try to distribute it evenly so everyone's working on roughly the same amount. Um, what ends up happening is sometimes someone will, you know, Len or whatever, he might be working on, like midway through the release season, he might get tied up working on a band's CD or a band's album. So he's not able to work on my stuff. So what happens is um, we'll have to do a little bit of load balancing at that point where if an engineer feels like they can't get stuff done, we will redistribute the workload. So an engineer will say, hey, I have some free time. I can take some work from someone else and we'll reassign stuff that way. So 
That's not automated. It'd be great if we can automate that, but right now it's sort of like Len and I are overseeing um, who's doing what, who has a little bit more time on their plate, who whose plate is full, and can we rearrange things so that things get done more more efficiently? So um, it ends up being like a year long process getting these videos on because, like you said, it's it it could be upwards of fifty bands, and a lot of them have multiple cameras. Um, that's more video that I have to sort and store on my array and make sure that I'm triaging and making sure I'm labeling. Okay, this is camera. This is the video from camera A, camera B, camera C. So it's a much more involved process with that. But um, I feel like having someone like Len, who's, you know, Len is mostly overseeing a lot of the audio. So I can depend on him to help keep, you know, help while I'm focusing on the video, he can help, he helps me, he helps stay on top of, um, here's what's left with the mixes. Here's where everyone's at, and um, he and I work together to redistribute that as needed. That, that's pretty wild that you have um, that everyone works together, and you do have that that constant verbal back and forth. Like, hey, I'm I'm buried, right? Like somebody just came into the studio and they want to do this. Okay, well, such and such over here will pick it up. So you you it talks about the things that we talk about on our teams where we talk about, hey, you know, it's not a it's not a J commits or a Sunny commits or a Person X commits is a team commits. So it, it does need to be shared and and balanced. Like I said, load balance. You talked about how you manage those dependencies, and that's awesome. And it's it's everybody coming in to do the thing, and, and you also have hinted about how hey, this is your labor of love, right? So getting get a second set of hands is always great. It, it's a lot like um, it sounds great in theory, but in application, it can, it's where you you've limited yourself because you created a dependency. Like so, we're talking about here we are one side of our mouth talking about limiting dependencies, the other side of the mouth we're talking about creating one. So it's that kind of balance of uh, how, how much is it really worth, it, right? Right. Okay, Sonny. Well, I think we're, we're hitting up about 40 minutes. I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So uh, I want to give you a chance to tell our listeners, you know, where can they find you? Um, where can they look for your stuff? How do they get in touch with you? All the social media type stuff. Um, if they want to find you, where do they go? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, my website is hate five, six. It's the word hate, the number five, the word six. Uh, I'm from South Jersey. So it's a play on the area code eight five six. Um, I'm on all socials at hate five six. Um, you'll find all my videos on the site. You'll find um, some band recommendation apps we didn't get a chance to talk about. So um, Sage is a um, artificially intelligent band recommendation app that I built that allows you to type in a list of bands that you like and a list of bands that you don't like. And Sage will come up with a list of recommendations based off of your taste profile. So it's using some modern AI to figure out um, you know, roughly where you sit in this whole space of bands that you like and dislike. So that's free to use. You can go in there. There's about two, over two, I think 250,000 bands on there. So it's not just hardcore. It spans all genres. Um, so check that out. I try to up that, I try to up that, update that as regularly as I can. Um, but yeah, that's mostly it. I have a medium blog that I'm going to try to post more uh, technical work to. So I have a couple articles on there about um, some algorithmic stuff that I'm working on, stuff about how Sage works, but I'm going to try to start updating that more to really shine light about, shine more light onto the, the technical software and um, all the inter, all, all the nerd stuff that, that powers the Hate by Six engine. And, and I didn't I didn't even want to touch on that. Uh, you you mentioned rate arrays. And I know we could legitimately spend another two hours going way down the hardware. You know, we, I, I, um, in the in the Discord channel, you had one where you were talking about the different types of rate arrays and which one do I go with. And and that is that's that would save that for a whole different other topic. Yeah. I'll actually get one of my hardware guys on because at that point you're speaking Greek to me. Uh, but for anybody who who uh, is curious, Sage really does work. It's almost uh, it's almost preternatural and eerie. If you put in bands that you like and don't like, especially if you, you're messing around and you know you're, you, you know what you're looking for, uh, the results that comes out were things that if somebody said to me, I like band X, where do I go? I would say, okay, well then try Z, M, and Q. Sage gets the same thing. And it only it's only getting smarter. So I can't I can't up that enough to anybody who's really looking for new uh, new music. So, uh, Sonny, on be, uh, behalf of the Agile Uprising, I'd like to really thank you for taking your time out tonight to join us. On behalf of Sonny and myself, I'd like to thank all of your listeners who are, are listening in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review, a rating, leave a comment on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcasting app of choice. It does help new listeners find us. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we ask that you maybe you want to subscribe and catch our episodes every week, every Sunday at 
12 p.m. Uh, not as not as prolific as Sunny, but we're getting there. Uh, there will be a thread posted about this episode on the coalition.agileuprising.com. So feel free to come in and hop in. And lastly, we also do have a Patreon set up for those who want to help defray the costs of hosting and production. Uh, you can see our show notes, and we'll have those details in there as well. So until next time, uh, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out.